Hi everyone. Today is Friday and we're going to Bush Gardens. It's going to be hot and steamy and we need to get wet. Welcome to Bush Gardens. So, see you inside. There's not a line like there was a couple of weeks ago, so that might be a good sign. They did have early access, so let's find out how quickly we can move on in. And we're moving right along. Hello, sir. I down the middle for them. Well, I have to say that was a lot better entry. And but we're gonna go ahead and go wait in line for our wrap sheet. See what's going on over here. Not exactly sure what's going on over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, how you doing? Don't forget to get your bush bucks and look at the nice picture of Iron Gwazi that they got on there. And yeah, if you haven't checked it out, the Serengeti tour is an excellent tour. So yeah, pick up your bush bucks before the end of this month. And uh, well, we're gonna go ahead and uh, see what other other things but uh, I think what we really want to do right now is try to see if we can get a time for Iron Gwazi um, haven't seen any runs on it yet but oh yeah there's the shirts that you wanted that's Kumba, that's Kumba. And Cheetah Hunt, and Shikra, and Iron Gwazi, a white one. Ooh. I like the colors on it. It's yeah. nice. So yeah, they have the new shirts right here at the front. And it's got a pocket. And it's got a pocket. She wants a pocket. 32. Well, do you want to spend your bush bucks on that? No, I'll spend my regular money on that. Okay. We're coming up to Iron Gwazi and we got a wait time of five minutes and we got Max over here and his buddy Chris. How's it going, Chris? What did I tell you about hanging around with Max? Didn't I tell you to stay away from this guy? Trouble. Trouble. He's going to teach you all the wrong ways of handling all this stuff. Hey, Max. Thank you. Got to just wait for my wife. Hold on to the glasses! Yeah. <laughs> He's way up there. How many did he say? Seven thirty uh, seven thirty seven thirty nine or seven fifty nine. Okay. He's way up there. Yeah. As you can see, there's a bit of a gap 
between the lap bar and my lap. So this is for your floater time when you're on Niagwazi. Now, if you look at that screen, when they say to pull down the lap bars, you pull it down until it turns green. You gotta make sure you got the right seat though. Once it turns green, you're locked in place. So you can leave a nice little gap between your lap and the, and the lap bar for some major air time. This is our second run on Iaguazi this morning. Second to the last row. So, see all those people in front of us. I'm going to try to hold the camera because it's good for you, but I don't know how well that's going to work. Wave at the camera! She warmed up. <laughs> she definitely warmed up. Penguin Point. Well, the path leading up to it. Looks like it's about ready to get transformed also. Hollow Scream is well on its way. Yay. Yay. And here we come up to the Tuxedo Birds. Also known as Penguin Point. And, oh, well, there's only one of them swimming. And the rest of them are, I don't know. Or Who knows? The train? train. Now we are heading over uh, to the Serengeti outpost because this is Zookeeper Appreciation Week. So they are having some specials on uh, different tours and different events. So we need to get over here to the Serengeti Outpost and see what they have available for past members. I think it is for past members only. So. Yeah, it's a bumpy, it feels like cobblestone. It kind of looks like cobblestone too. But uh, yeah, here we come up to the Serengeti Outpost. And yeah, the little groups are coming through already. Oh, uh, hopefully Camping we- Camping groups. Camping groups. Yeah, there was a sign. Uh, and we got Gator Talk, Edge of Africa, Nutrition Center Tour at 11.30 and 1. Tiger Trail Interaction. So, which one are you looking forward to? The Tiger Trail Interaction. Yeah, let's see what we have available. Uh, we have uh, Big Jim sitting in the water. And Bubba is over there in the shade. The best way to keep cool. Mm -hmm. We have uh, some scheduled times for our zookeeper experiences. The uh, zookeeper experiences, gator talks, tiger trail, 
um, nutritional center, all kinds of goodies, uh, elephants. Um, you can you can really get uh, uh, a lot of information from those zookeeper experiences. So, uh, looks like Bubba's on the move. Where are you going, Bubba? <laughs> I don't know how this happened. Maggie picked the back row. I picked the second in the back row, but way over here. Um, we're on Monte, by the way. So, uh, I don't see Jessica in there, in the panel room. So let's see. Get a good view over here on this side parking lot for a preferred parking not that bad and well it doesn't look like there's a long line of people trying to get in uh, this parking lot over here is starting to fill up but yeah get a nice view of Tampa over here I could have sworn it would have been down a lot longer than it has been but um, from what I gather there were rumors that it was testing yesterday so we just took a chance and decided to come up here um, we did ride Montu and saw Cobra's Curse running so we decided to come over here and see how well Cobra's Curse is running um, we didn't see Jessica over there at Montu, and we didn't see her here at Cobra's Curse, so she might be playing hooky. Here's Cobra's Curse.
Cobra's curse is upon you. to spin. Oh, we got going. <laughs> and back to right where we started. Debbie is playing around this morning. Really trying to get a hold of that stick, aren't you? Good morning, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> See you later, Debbie. And here we go. We're going to start our nutrition tour. Get some behind the scenes action. Now, he just said that the kitchen is one place that normally guests don't get to see. So, we're going to get a nice exclusive look at the kitchen. Okay. We'll we'll get yelled at later. <laughs> I don't normally yell at people, but I have one occasion. Alright, come through here. This is my office. And we're gonna go through to the kitchen. It's a working kitchen. There are people working in there, there's food everywhere. So just can we take pictures? You can take pictures in there. Don't take a picture of my office. <laughs> So we can take pictures and yep behind the scenes iron guazi sneak peek <laughs> All right, so we are parking in the shade and we are going into the bush garden zoo nutritional center How's it going? Hey Chris, how are you doing? Thank you, yeah, doing pretty good. Good Oh, look at all that good food. I want to say about 150 species. Oh, I don't know. 
Oh, okay. There's around 2,000 animals. Anyone know how many species we have here? 30. I saw it on the sign. Okay. <laughs> 30 different species. Okay. Okay. We have more than 30 species. Yeah, yeah. 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 We have more than 30 species, species of birds. Okay. <laughs> Probably close to 150. That may be pretty close. I'll find out. But there's around 2,000 animals, not counting. So that's a lot of animals anyway. So back in the day, we, so we're centralized now, which means we make diets ready to be fed. So back, way back when I started, so I've been here for almost 28 years. So back when I started, all the different areas have satellite kitchens in them. And this was more like a grocery store, like a sand. Keepers would come in and take all their stuff. We really had no idea what they were taking or how much. And they would just leave and we would reorder. And at some point, someone realized this is the biggest budget in the zoo. Anyone have any idea how much it costs to feed all these animals a year? A couple of million. We're right around 1.4 million. Okay. Oh. 1.4 million. So it's the biggest budget in the zoo. It's actually bigger than the hospital. At some point, we decided we need to get control of the, the budget, what animals are eating, the food, all of it. So we centralized the kitchen. So when we did that, we quadrupled our workload instead of sending out cases of apples, they're now sending out individual bag diets with apples cut to the size that they want for whatever they're doing, all the diets. So we enormously increased our workload. So we suddenly became about organization, efficiency, and accuracy. So if we make a mistake in here now and the dot keepers pick it up and go to their area, they gotta open up their area, all their SOPs for opening up their area, and then they then, ooh, this is the wrong food. Close down their area, come back here, get the right diet, go back out there, open their area back up. We can waste an hour of their time for one little mistake. So we try not to. Everything I'm gonna show you is all about efficiency and accuracy. So we had to make all these diets. Back in the day, we started with these diet patterns. And this is a good example because we still kind of use them, but we had hundreds of these all lined up on that rack up there. But these are these are just for problems. But you can see it has the animal. Every animal has a diet card number that's specific to that animal. All the days of the week, everything is weighed in grams now, so nothing leaves here without being weighed in grams. This is the item. So these are all the items that he gets on the different days of the week, and these are cutting instructions. So if you look right here. It's a piece of paper with cutting instructions. So if they ask for something small, medium, large, thin, cut, that's our guy. So whoever's working in here can look at that and go, okay, medium needs a cube that size. So consistency. And then also for accuracy, this is our tolerance and weights. So if you're weighing something 500 grams or more, you can be off up to 10 grams. If it's something smaller, so if you just have a little bird that has a little bitty diet, if you're off by 10 grams, you could double the diet. Yeah, mealworms. Yeah. So if you only weigh 10 grams, you only have a of like one. Pretty echidnas and... 11, you're good. Yeah. 12, you need to take some. So those are like some standards, but um, the problem with these is they get very confusing. You're, you know, what's today? Friday? Yeah. Friday's not bad. They're all in a row and they're not broken up. All these little lines and someone calls, someone comes in with a question, someone calls on the phone, you miss something, you get on the wrong day. There are lots of mistakes coming out of here. Out of when you do hundreds of these a day, you start going cross-eyed and stuff like that. So we switched to touch screens. Right here, this made things so much better. Well, that's going up. So this is the original zoo building back from the 60s when the zoo was a lot smaller. Um, so this, this room is pretty small. You've been to like Disney's Animal Kingdom and seen their kitchen, it's like 10 times as small as this. So we're kind of constrained by space. So we spent 10 years moving tables around, trying to figure out the best place for them, because we pull out carts and have food everywhere, and people are going in and out of the cooler, and if people are in each other's way, it just makes it less efficient. So this is the best scenario of tables that we came up with. So this table here does small diet tables, or diets, so they do a lot of the birds and little animals, and a lot of intricate diets. This does large animals, primates, elephants, giraffes, hippos, things like that. The meat and the fish table over there does all the meat and fish. Any idea why it would separate the tables? Cross contamination. Yep, cross contamination. You, at your house, you probably have a cutting board for chicken and a cutting board for vegetables. And that's because you don't want the salmonella getting into vegetables. It's even worse for animals. There's a lot of animals that are super sensitive. You can kill an animal with salmonella real quick. Or eat some things like that and just not call into it. And then over here is our chopper table. So we have a big chopping machine and we make fresh salads every day. 
that go to this table, and this table makes diets using those fresh salads, fruit salads, green salads, all sorts of things, which is pretty cool. This is still not pulling up. Here's some examples. So now instead of these, they're all in here. But now, instead of showing everything for the week, it only shows what's made today, which helps reduce errors, keeps you from going cross-eyed. So we just go through these. You know, we have several hundred of these that we go through. Now, we also have stickers like this. So every diet we make on here who has a diet card has a corresponding sticker. It should all be in the exact same order. It's all organized by area. So we start with, well, this is elephants. And then this, and then Jungal is an area, and then Miami is an area. So they're all organized by area. So every diet you make should have a sticker. If you have a sticker without a diet card, that means there's a problem. What happened? Did the animal move? Did an animal go to the hospital? Did it leave property? Why? So you gotta stop, you gotta get in the system, look up that animal, find out what's going on. If there's a diet card without a sticker, same thing. So this helps reduce errors animals move all the time. Um, also on this table to help reduce time, all that Tupperware up there on that cart. So as everything is now in the database, we can run reports. So I can run a report. So this tells me all the stuff we need for that table tomorrow and the amounts we need. So we take it out of the thing. We prep all those Tupperware with all those items for the amount. And then tomorrow when you do the diets, you put your cutting board, you put the Tupperware all around your cutting board, and you've got everything you need in the right amount. You shouldn't have a Google all day. It saves a lot of time. It also prevents waste. Like if you have apples out all day, you put them away and you want to use them again tomorrow, maybe they're turning brown, maybe they're not as fresh. This way, everything's used by the end of the day. You put new stuff in, and the next day, you're good. That's the, these are super helpful. They save us a lot of time. Um, Dry goods, so almost every diet has some sort of dry good in it. So this is insectivore, this one has a primate biscuit, this one has Harrison Lifetime and Missouri. Um, all these white bins everywhere are all the dry goods, they're like grain products. You can see the labels, they're designed for all dark sorts of different animals. Um, kangaroo, insectivore, different kinds of birds. So almost every diet has some of that in it. If we had stop, find, find it, roll it over, pay out the lemon, put it back, we'd be here until midnight. So what we do is there are blue bins over there, we made those. Those are all in the exact same order, the stickers and the diet cards. It's a lot faster when they tenor and throw them in there. At the end of the day, we have extra time to roll this. So we roll this up when we do the table, and we just pull them out as we go along. So now we can get out of here on time. It's really important to us. They work so well, we have them all over the place. Under there, under here, there's some back there. Pre-made work fantastic. Really, really like them. Uh, what else in here? We have a stove. We don't use it very often. We cook like hard-boiled eggs and we boil sweet potatoes. And that's about it. Occasionally, we make gels. We have worms over there. And I'll tell you about worms when we go to our worm farm. We already know. Yeah. You already know. They know. We know about worms. You know about worms? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to find out why when we go. Uh, any questions about the They're delicious. The kitchen? Anything we do? <laughs> questions about diets? Do people make their, uh, like, per animal? Or, is, like, do people yeah. get here and they send it out to the zoo? No, so I have staff specifically that work just in here. Mm -hmm. And they, so like here, this is a chestnut mandible toucan. Make that. And you have a white neck rate for four inches of two animals. What? Or small groups, so two the ranges work together. Yeah. Both your diets can be put together into one diet because they're being fed together. Maybe like an aviary, you super yeah, worms. maybe like 20 birds and push them all into one well, diet. Yeah. They have individual diet cards, oh, you can enjoy them all. They have one group diet. They're too big. Um, where did they put the, like, so when they're making them and people, where they put it from people, you know, oh, yeah. Okay. Brandy, can you grab me a bucket? Any bucket. I've got a bucket. I don't even care what kind. I'm going to show you the keeper's best friend, and I'm going to tell you why. If you go to pretty much any zoo in the United States, you're going to get the same thing. Except for any zoo. You've got to do your thing. <laughs> uh, five gallon bucket. This is the keeper's best friend. We can get them for free, use your barbecue sauce comes in them, or whatever, from culinary. So they usually wash them up. We can go pick them up. Keepers love them because you can't overload them. I can't put 100 pounds of food in this. I can put 100 pounds of food in a big bin and then the keepers complain because they can't pick it 
up or back or whatever. So you can't overload them. They stack super nice. Pretty much they're going up. So when I started in here, we would go through a thousand buckets a year easy. And it was driving me insane. Where are they going? I just keep picking up buckets every day and they just keep disappearing. So I went out in the parking lot, I looked at the back of everyone's truck, stacks of buckets and everyone's pickup trucks. I know where they're going. So I started putting tape on them. This is not a good example, but white buckets with different colored duct tape. So each area had their own color. These guys did such a good job, I bought a blue bucket instead of blue tape. But uh, I said, all right, I know you use two buckets a day. I'll give you 10 buckets. If you lose them, like that one, there's some tape on it. That's the hospital bucket. If you lose them, there's six bucks a piece on Amazon. I was going to buy them and charge your cost. Yeah. We never lost another bucket again. I, I haven't picked up buckets from food service in so long, they don't even save them. <laughs> These guys, I mean, they're falling apart from old age. They duct tape them together to try not to have to buy them. They did such a good job that I started replacing them with colored buckets for that. Oh. That's, that is our general container. Now, bigger, like big hook stock or my, like uh, chimps and gorillas going big bins. This is our staple right as it is most of the food. And probably around the world. So they, once they make the foods, where do they put them? You know, so that's okay. We're going to go in there. How early do y'all get started? We get started at 6. So we work 6 to 2.30, okay. and it's the best shift ever. Now I go to bed by 9 every night. <laughs> other than that, we're here before the traffic starts. We have no problem getting to work. And at 2.30 when we leave, the traffic is not bad. So for those of us who live like 20 miles away, if we have to come in at 9 or leave at 5, it doubles our commute time. It's awful. So I love my schedule. Totally. Yes, this is amazing. There are, there's myself, there's one full timer, and five part timers. Now the part timers only work 28 hours a week. So that small amount of crew, we do. You've only seen a little piece of it. I'm going to show you the rest of it. But yes, we do all of it. Disney has 35 full timers that do what we do. Roughly the same size collection. We're just more efficient. That 2.30 is not a bad idea until it rains in the afternoon. I can drive home. <laughs> Better than working at it. Any more questions in here? Nothing? All right, let's go right through that door. You're about to see my favorite place all summer. Just pull it towards you. Ooh. Pull that handle right towards you. There you go. So, yeah, mealworms for Maya. I didn't see any wax worms in there, but. There's some in there. There's some? Don't pick at it. Ah. <laughs> ah, doesn't this feel nice? Yes. Oh, I can sit in here all day. All right, let's start with some worms here. Ooh. You guys know what they are. Yeah. Yep. You don't count. What are these? Mealworms. Mealworms, yeah. Why do we keep them in the fridge? To keep them alive. Keep them alive, yeah. They kind of like hibernate when they're in the fridge. So yep. If you put these out in the kitchen, they're turned to beetles eventually. In the fridge, they can last six, seven months, no problem. You don't have to feed them in the fridge. You don't have to give them water in the fridge. When you take them out there, you got to start feeding them, giving them a water source and things like that. Every animal in the zoo pretty much loves these things. Yep. I even got little kid campers eat them. You know, they for dares and stuff. It's yeah. always fun to get them. <laughs> okay, so the question of this this shelf right here, you see all these diets on here. All the areas are labeled on here to correspond to their different colored buckets and stuff. So this is all Looks the like diets fish. today that are produce. So it's 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, the keepers show up and they will take all this food. And then they leave and then we remake all this food. And this is, a, this is just part of it. This is the meat and fish, keep it separate. So all the different areas. So tomorrow they're coming to take these buckets and these diets. This will all be wiped out. All the big diets we put on carts, so that's like chicks and gorillas and things like that. Elephants goes on carts, so they get the cart. And they come and pick up the milk and stuff there. They come and pick up the carts at 7 o'clock. So, three okay. or six, five days a year, we, they pick it up, we remake it. <laughs> yes, so it's Keeper Appreciation Week, so every day we're doing different things. Today's cookie day, so all the keepers can come pick up the keys. You know, it's a month. So produce, we get the same produce as the human restaurants, same distributor, same everything. 
we get, this is a really small bridge for our operation. So I do just in time inventory. So we get deliveries on Tuesdays and Fridays. So we got deliveries today, so we're packed up. But come Tuesday, there won't be hardly anything left. That way, our carrying cost is lower. To a lot easier to rotate stuff. We have a lot less stuff going bad. And I make the delivery drivers come in, load the shelves, and rotate everything for us. They love me. No, they don't. But <laughs> Jersey. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you want to go in there again, I'm only going to stay a second, and I'll show you what it's like, and we're going to zip up. Sound good? Yep. Okay. We're going to go into the subarctic freezer here. Yeah. The rodents too. <laughs> so I get my rodents, I try to buy everything local that I can just to support the local people. And so there's a rodent farmer who is about 45 minutes north of here. So we go inspect his farm, make sure he's euthanizing him properly, and we buy from him, which is great. We've been buying from him for 15 years. He hand delivers everything to us, the owner does. Which is great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Freezer. <laughs> yeah, frozen rodents. Everyone likes to see that sign. If you have glasses, forget about it. You're not going to see it. And watch out for the edge. <laughs> Don't step off the edge. This is not tour friendly. Okay, right behind you, this is where all the buckets and bins come back. Step up a little. Yeah. Step up the side here. That would end the tour really bad. Um, <laughs> we'll go over here. Cardboard we recycle as much as we can. There's a yellow garbage can in the kitchen. That's where all the food waste goes. And the garbage that we can't recycle goes to the garbage. And then any cardboard Keep the birds out. Very good. Very good. So this is one of our grain docks. Uh, not, not the best grain dock in the world. It's hot, humid. Birds can get in and out here. So uh, I do just in time inventory in here as well. So come Wednesday, most of this should be gone. We try to turn everything over within a few weeks, two or three weeks at the most. That keeps it fresh. We've done studies on it. At these temperatures and humidity, you get about five months. We try to keep it, everything at least under a month at the most. So this is great. Cool. Let's go this way. Birds. Wild birds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much any other birds around here that are not belonging to bush gardens.
Yeah, we're behind the scenes, guys. <laughs> so this is our other little drain room. This is actually the old hospital for folks who have been coming to Bushton for a long time. It smells you good guys in here. You know that there's a new hospital down there, probably about six years old. Um, when they moved out of here, I just squat. I just took over everything. I just moved everything in these rooms, slapped a sign above the door, and it suddenly became mine, which is fantastic. So there's still like an X-ray machine in the corner and stuff like that. So I moved some grain in here. Um, we were having some problems with rodents getting into them. So this flamingo powder is like $100 a bag, and every night someone would rip open a corner and poop in it. So I'd have to throw it out. $100 a day, $100 a day, $100 a day. I'm like, this is crazy. So we moved it in here. We don't have any problems in this room. They went after the macropod, so I moved that in here. And I'm like, forget it, I got shelves, and I moved anything that was sweet in here. We don't have any problems now. I haven't. I can't remember the last time I threw a bag of grain on, which is great. Yeah. Then we have all these old surgical shelves. Uh, I put all the sweet things in here that keepers just love feeding their animals, so that I have control over it. No one's allowed to touch any of it without asking first. I don't want a primate eating a gallon of syrup in a week. Right? Right. So I take tight control. It's great enrichment. We have spices in here. We have extracts. We have all sorts of stuff. Jalapenos. We've got all sorts of nice stuff. Uh, wow. Um, yeah, some some animals like to like roll on it and play with it and smell it. And some might eat it. Some primates might eat it. Uh, I love them. I eat them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you see uh, like a tiger or lion? The spices, they roll in it. It's like catnip for yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> Hold on one second. Follow me this way. Wildlife ward. And nutrition grain storage area. Bless you. <laughs> Worm farm. Worms. Yeah, mealworms. So this is the old lab of the old hospital. This is all the microscopic worms, pets were working there. We can see those and stuff. Once they left, we sort of turned it into a worm farm. Beetles. So I was. In the kitchen, I was experiencing problems getting worms on a consistent basis. A lot of it. Ah, uh, yeah, you can watch it. That'd be great. Mealworms. A lot of the farms were like Rubco and things like that were running out pretty consistently, and it took them months to get their stock back. You know, I don't know if a virus went through and wiped them out or whatever. And everyone loves worms at the zoo, so I didn't want to run out of them. So uh, one of our keepers, Tammy, said, "Oh, you know, I'll, t I'll try farming them." So she, we gave her the series, we set it all up, and she's been amazingly successful. So she started with some super worms and mealworms. She puts them in here, and then within a couple weeks, they pupate into one of those weird looking alien things. And then a couple weeks from then, then they turn into beetles. And then the beetles will lay eggs, and the eggs turn into super worms. And that's sort of the life cycle. Oh, okay. And they keep going. And they keep going, going and going and going. And so you end up with something like this. Which is just filled with all these adult oh, well, super worms. To draw and then Tammy brings them over to us and we get to feed them out. Awesome. And I will say, when we grow them here, they're so much bigger and fatter and healthier. <laughs> yeah. Because otherwise they get stuck in a, a box and then right. they get shipped at super hot temperatures yeah. in the back of a plane and then Can a FedEx truck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the quality mm. is so much better. Mm. You want to hold one? Oh, yeah. That's they have gigantic teeth, so we gotta be careful. You have that other Mm hmm. And if you guys ever made it to the bottom of a tequila bottle, you may recognize this. Yeah. Not that I've ever done <laughs> Oh, little tiny ones. Those are uh, mealworms. Yeah. Any questions about worm farming? Because we have the expert here. So if I can't answer it, she can. Hi. Hi. How many calories per worm? Yeah, yeah. I mean, really it's killing me. They're so small. Water, which is three. I don't know. I'm making it up. Three. 
friends. Right. <laughs> oh my god. They've got everything they need. Okay. We go, and then I could tell you how many grams if I looked it up here, but we probably go through a big bowl. Put in the soil to keep soil warm. Same thing. Whatever that is. <laughs> how many grams of which ones? Uh, Lots super of worms. We go through 800 grams a week. There you go. Wow. 800 wow. grams a week. About. She makes them. She grows them. So she knows. Cool. Um, mealworms, we do a lot more. I don't have a number on those. Yeah. But we use a lot more. I, yeah. A couple hundred thousand every three months. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. No, Let's go. Well, everybody loves Take some mealworms. Right there. No, no, right there. Yep. Anything that's coming into the park, um, and also we do wildlife rehab, so I take care of this as well. And that's Tammy, yeah, our worm I farmer. Yeah. Oh, look at those. I'm, I'm technically a bird nerd. I'm a This is the, the old knee crossing room. You guys know what a knee crossing is? You guys know what an autopsy is? Oh. <coughs> so if you dissect something that's the same species as you, so if you dissect a human, it would be an autopsy. If you dissect something other than yourself, it's a knee crossing. So if an alien came down and dissected you, it would be a knee crossing. Anyways, that's why there's lights in here. I digress. This is not what we're doing. Um, <laughs> so this is our browse room. So I was talking about how we had a browse farm that we use the compost that we make. So we don't. It's not huge. It's a quarter acre, and we feed the entire zoo minus elephants one day a week. So we do Wednesday. So we go out and harvest every Wednesday, and we supply browse for the entire zoo. The other six days of the week, we have to buy browse. So this is one of the companies that we buy from Koala Browse. And it's a box of browse, and when I say browse, it's just leaves. Oh. So just leaves from trees and plants that are edible. So we probably have 30 species that we get in. This one is copper leaf. But there's a, so I get 23 boxes twice a week, so 46 boxes a week. These are $65 a piece plus overnight shipping. So if you do the math, it's right around $300,000 a year with this company for browse. We also, uh, so now the elephants <coughs> would eat millions of dollars worth of browser meat because you're humongous. So when I was trying to figure out what to do with elephants, um, the company that, I, so originally I got banana leaves, which is how we started the browse thing, and there was $6 a piece, just a banana leaf. And I'm like, I know I can grow banana plants, and that's how we started the garden. But that same company we got the banana leaves from, they, he has a coconut farm, and he grows coconuts and he sells the juice to health food stores. So he's got a huge coconut farm and he grows banana trees and all sorts of stuff. So we went down to visit him, toured his place, it was great. And I asked him, so what do you do with all your trimmings? He's like, oh, we compost them. I'm like, you ever thought of selling them? He's like, what? <laughs> and so now he brings a semi up once a week and loads the entire open barn full with browse and that lasts him the entire week. And so he loves me. <laughs> he's making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year on his trimmings. <laughs> and the elephants love it because they're getting fresh trend stuff every week and so and I only I pay a lot for that. Buy local. So that's the, exactly. that's the yeah. browse bar. I can't take you guys out to the browse bar because it's way, I don't know, big truck. way out yonder. Any questions about browse? No? Okay. Why do they call browse instead of just leaves? Because it's, we call it browse because it's for browser animals, animals that browse, so they usually are like little prehensile lips. Think of like a giraffe with a long tongue, it's browsing, it's grabbing the browse. They're called, they're called browsers. That's why. Is there typically like a mate, like a big distributor you get most of your food from, and then you go like for the animals from the Pacific, or do you think so manage So, like the produce? Uh, like more like things that maybe. Like this stuff here, you know. Things like wouldn't go to a restaurant, but that are specific for animals. So I probably have 70 vendors. Okay, so you're managing a ton of them. A lot of them are small family vendors, okay. you know, for Probably. specific things like bat vitamins. So yeah. Lower okay. heat vitamins, food. And so there's, yeah, I have a ton a of them. Missouri is the major grain producer. So a lot of, most of our bags out there on the, are mostly through Missouri. They're the big zoo uh, producer. But yeah, we, I have tons of vendors. All the produce comes from we're using San Juan, which is here in Tampa, um, but we've used all the big ones that you can think of, Mr. Greens, and uh, I don't know, there's yeah, a lot of We bid it out every year for the, for the food stuff. So, so whoever can give us the best.
grass fed and meet all of our criteria. Any other questions? So what sort of educational background do you have for a job? Do I have or yeah. do you need? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so I grew up in Connecticut, like went to University of Connecticut. I got a degree in genetics, four year degree in genetics, and I moved down here with all my buddies because Connecticut's freezing cold and Florida's <laughs> awesome. So we moved to Florida and then I ran out of money and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to have to get a job. And so Bush Gardens is right down the street. I always loved animals, being outdoors. That was 28 years ago. So I got a job, my first real job outside of college, kind of, and I, I never left, I'm still here. Um, since I've been here, I got a master's degree in business administration, so I got my MBA, they paid for it. And so that's kind of me. I don't use genetics so much, but a general science. So if someone was to ask me what I'd recommend, if you absolutely know you want to be a zookeeper and there's no question, Santa Fe is a great school. You're going to learn all sorts of animal stuff. I have tons. My one full timer went to Santa Fe. Um, tons of keepers here went to Santa Fe. It's a great school for them. The zoo director at Santa Fe worked with me for years. I know him, Jonathan Mio. I know him really, really well. Um, that's a great app. Now, I would also say if you're not 100% sure that's what you want to do, you might want to do something like science, general science, or something else. Business is a great one. Every zoo is a business. Every Everything is a business in this country. So a business degree is super helpful. Something that you can spin off outside of the zoo. You're not going to make a billion dollars in the zoo. It's just not that kind of field. It's mostly because people love animals, and that's why they're here. I will say when I host a part-time position, I have hundreds of people applying just for a part-time position. So the comp competition is humongous. Um, so I always recommend thinking outside of the zoo. What can you do with a degree that you can work in a zoo, but you can also do something else outside if it doesn't work, or you need, you know, I need to make some money at some point, you need to go somewhere else. Um, experience is huge too. Volunteer at, you know, the aquarium takes volunteers, Lowry Parks takes volunteers, a lot of the um, rescue places take volunteers. Experience, experience, experience is huge. When you, a lot of times, you have 100 of resumes and you just narrow it down by experience and those top 30 make your desk. The rest you don't even see. So just getting some basic experience. At Santa Fe, you're gonna to get tons of experience while you go to school, which is awesome. So you're gonna have all this stuff to put on there and in interviews or have all these great stories to talk about. Um, so if you know you wanna be a zookeeper, I'm gonna recommend this one. So that's that's my two cents. If you have someone else in the zoo, they may tell you something, something. <laughs> when you started there, did you start in the animal side or did you start like? I did. I started part time in the hoofstock okay. way back when. So I worked in the hoofstock part time for six months. And then there was an opening in Miami working with chimps and gorillas. And then when I went there. And then from there, I just moved all over the zoo. Cool. Here I am. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite animal? Hippos. Mm, so I yeah. used to dive the hippo tank, suck up all the hippo poop underwater. <laughs> oh. I love it. It's not like poop poop, it's just hay on the bottom at that point. But all the fish, have you been into EOA? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you should go to EOA and check out the hippo pool. It's awesome. All these colorful mm -hmm. cichlids everywhere. So we put dive gear on twice a week and I dive in. The hippos are just fun. They're like big Homer Simpson cows. <laughs> <laughs> They're just awesome. They make cool noises. I like the pool. I like swimming every day with them. Not with you them. Do but that during hours or after hours? After hours. Yeah. So we always did it after hours. And there's an electric fence that runs around the window. I can't tell you how many times I go up to clean the window with a metal squeegee. And <laughs> <laughs> you would think I would learn, but like 40 <laughs> times I did. And Debbie's in the habitat today. What's that? Debbie's, Debbie's in, in there. Yeah. Yep. I've seen hippos born on that habitat, which are super cool. Mm. What other questions? It's your opportunity. <laughs> Reminds of the blanket a moment. <laughs> Alright, cool. Now I'm gonna Put kick, you out, kick you out back in the park. Okay, bye. Alright, let's go. <laughs> Alrighty. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> that was some great information. Okay. You guys are on duty. Okay. We'll close the doors behind us. <clears throat> and that is the nutrition center. They deal with thousands and thousands and thousands of animals and 
uh, yeah. Now we're gonna go ahead and check out the past member lounge. Thank you. And see uh, see what else there is. And hey, uh, before I get in too much trouble, we're gonna get another behind the scenes look. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Oop. I'll show you. Yeah, so there's also uh, a huge crocodile. Okay. And a uh, Nile crocodile in there. Oh, cool. Okay. It's like 14 feet long. It's like a fungus. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh, so you see out of my office. <laughs> Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Cliff. Yeah. Bye, guys. I hope you liked it. Oh, we had a fun. we have a leopard gecko. Oh, do you? Cool. Yeah. Loves a meal. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, oh, ball, I gotta tell them where you are. ball python that loves the uh, rats, the rodents. Yeah. All right. So you're and, and about what? Ten cockatiels. Oh my god. Nine. <laughs> Nine. 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 And one budgie. <laughs> yeah. Same place. I think. Well, double. Before we went to the nutritional center. We got a time for cheetah hunt, uh, but this time I'm over here, all the way over here on this other side. So let's see what it looks like. amount of air time. area where you can sit down and recharge.
if we showed these work walls earlier but there are work walls there and well we all know what that means getting ready for a hollow scream pink chickens we're just gonna go ahead and walk by our Laura Keat friends. Looks like they put some more birds in there. Yeah. Hello. That one's weird looking. All I have to say is the sun is brutal today. So, we're heading on over to Jangala for our tour of the tiger area. The reason for that being those subspecies are from a higher point. If you're looking at a map, they're from India and that kind of belt around there. Whereas the Malayan tigers are from that Malay Peninsula, so it's much more south, so it's a lot more tropical. So we kind of feel like being here, where it's very hot. <laughs> <laughs> so they're smaller, so they don't have a lot of fur in comparison to the bigger guys that have a lot of fat stores and a lot of fur to keep them warm during those colder kind of bits of time. So we're kind of just hanging out right now and doing what tigers do best. Tigers, just like house cats, they do sleep a lot. So they sleep about 20 hours a day. <laughs> Typically, he is so excited to train and do whatever. He usually hears us coming up. We're actually on the second floor of our house. Um, we also have a roof where we can toss food from, but all of the bedrooms for the cats are downstairs. Um, but he is just kind of hanging out today, which is excellent. But you can get a pretty good view of him right now and see what makes those characteristics that make tigers tigers. So obviously he has that beautiful orange coat and those nice stripes going on. So even though it's a little counterintuitive, orange is actually the first color that disappears in their habitat. Um, so these, it's perfect for camouflage. They uh, will move in those tall grasses and the forested areas and their stripes actually mimic the kind of light shadows between all of that plant material that they're moving in between. So that is the theory as to why they are orange and with stripes. Another idea that scientists have is that a lot of their prey species, whether it be small varieties of deer, things like that, pigs, they see a little bit differently than we do. So where we see oranges and browns and blues, a lot of those prey species see more in blue and green. So they can't really pick up that orange and red color. So they actually see tigers as green. So they blend in incredibly well <laughs> because they are green as well. Uh, Rukaya is nine like i was saying before so he's kind of in the prime of life he is part of our ssp which is species survival plan because he is a malayan tiger he is critically endangered there are only about 50 in you in u.s zoos and overall there's about 250 left in the wild which is insane <laughs> um overall the subspecies of tigers are endangered overall um, but ssp wise here in the u.s we're going to focus on the sumatrans malayans and the abhor siberian tigers Typically down here in Florida, the hotter states are going to see Malayans and Sumatrans because they're from the island regions that are more like the snow. The climate is a lot more similar than it would be for, let's say, a Siberian tiger coming from Russia. Those are typically northern zoo animals. Like you guys used to have the white tigers. So white tigers are just Bengal tigers. Yes. So Bengal tigers are the only subspecies that have color variation. So it's a great observation. So it's kind of like us 
we all have different color hair. So it's the same with white tigers. It's kind of just like having blonde hair and blue eyes and two recessive genes. So it's, it's very interesting. The and they're problem, still here. They are still here. They're still here out back. Oh, yes. yes. Yep, we still have two. Uh, they just have gotten older. Sure. All of our bangles are quite a bit aged. Um, Zara still lives in the house, which is doing great. Uh, but our other bangles, they're all 16 now. Um, and obviously our habitats are very, <laughs> they have a lot of um, elevation changes going on. So it's a little harder when cats get old, they get arthritis in their backs and their joints. Who doesn't? Exactly. <laughs> Me too. I'm not even like, I got a lot more mileage, but exactly. So we are fortunate enough to have a behind the scenes area that's very flat and has big pools. So they hang out there now and it is a lot better for their joints and their bodies overall. But yes, it is really cool that the Bengals yeah, have their color variation. Beautiful. Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, the white tigers, it was one tiger that kind of had that variation. People thought it was cool because they bred it. So it comes along with a lot of health issues, as you can imagine, which is, we do not do that anymore. Uh, we still have them. Obviously, we are committed to our cats. We make sure that they are taken care of. And we would never do anything. <laughs> but they, we do not breed for that, no. But we want to make sure that what we do breed, which is why we have the Species Survival Grant, they pair animals based on genetics to create the healthiest offspring possible. We want to have that viable that we have anything is going to happen to these guys out in the wild, then let's say that they go extinct out in the wild, there is still a viable population in managed here. Yeah. Any questions so far? Not so much. So, like, is it like date night? Or is it like date night? Or is it just like. It is a whole process. Nothing, yeah. It's very, though, is very scientific. So, it is a whole process. So, for example, Rukaya had two siblings. He was born here nine years ago. So his brother, Gunnar, and his sister, Sinta, have thus gone off to breeding recommendations. But essentially what happens is the SFP has a panel of scientists. They look at those genetic history and kind of see, was this animal healthy? What if we paired this animal with this animal? There's a lot of Excel sheets and science things. And it <laughs> kind of determines who's going to make the healthiest offspring that we were talking about. From there, they make recommendations as to where tigers should be shipped, moved, semen should be collected, things like that. And then it's up to the zoo to go forth with those recommendations or to not based on different reasons. So, Udar, for example, was shipped out about a year ago to Baton Rouge. Cinta has been to a couple different zoos, but right now she's in Jacksonville on a breeding rack as well. Um, and then from there, once everybody's situated, you have your two cats, and then it comes introduction. Tigers are a little bit different um, than other cat species. They are a solitary cat species. So even though you might see them sometimes in managed care in groups, only well, because they were raised together, those, all the behaviors monitored very closely to make sure those relationships are kept up. But naturally solitary. So any kind of introduction can be very dangerous. So you, it's a whole process. You make sure that they are kind of jiving with each other, that the time of the month is correct, um, makes a big difference. So it's, knowing the animals and making sure you're having a staff that is confident with that process. And then from there, hopefully you have babies. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very big step in the middle there, but yes, whole process. But a lot of fun. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully we're okay. He is on that list, but it is to be determined what his situation is. Yes, but hopefully, because his brother and his sister are contributing in that way already, his kind of genetic line is already being represented by it's really long. Yeah. Any other questions about Rude? He's being such a good boy, just hanging out with the flappers down there. Yeah. Not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, not being real helpful for the scene. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I might have also noticed there is a lot of water on most of the habitat. So tigers are one of the few semi-aquatic cats. So tigers and jaguars really are the only ones that really enjoy it. So he doesn't really hunt in the water like jaguars do, um, but he does get in their loft, swims around. They actually have webbed paws. So if you ever get a chance to see him, uh, which I'll probably throw some enrichment in for him so you can get a little fat, um, you might get to see the webbed paws on his whole body.
Yeah. So it's just him out here. He's just talking about now, wondering what we're doing. <laughs> He's very good at that part. Anybody have any questions? you. Yeah, typically in managed care, we can get up another 20. Our oldest was 20, but she was 20 when she passed away. Um, out in the wild, it's going to be significant in the last 30 years. If we get into double digits, um, obviously we don't have a good one. What's uh, Rue's diet like? Yeah, so uh, our tigers eat what we call a carnivore diet. So it is essentially ground up meat. It looks very similar to meat that we buy, um, but it's a little different. We buy muscle meat, and what they have is the whole animal mixed up. So you get your muscle meat, your organs, bones, everything's in there. It's a nice balanced diet for them. Hmm. Um, if they were to need supplements that would go like through our vets and things like that, we would ask based on what they need. They also get larger bones and things like that on a more specific basis. But those big items that they have to pull apart help clean their teeth, which is really nice. Is that all, the supplements and all, is that all added at the no. nutrition center before it comes here? It's a problem. We haven't had to do that in a long time. We, we, did, we did the uh, nutrition center yeah, tour. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic out there. We do love them. Yeah. So. <laughs> If you guys would like, we also have the pop up. It is open. If you would like to go and pop your head under there, it's a great pop up. place to see his little beans from. Okay. <laughs> is he sitting on the pop up? Yeah. He's playing, being a good boy. Aww. <laughs> Hi, Vru. He's like, oh, I'm so tired. It's a good angle of his teeth from here. Tigers have about three to four inch canine teeth that are really deeply seated in their skull. Does it bother them if they have canines? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Probably. <laughs> they are very specific. Um, there was the one place they had a big plastic ball. So one of the tigers fit in and it was like, you can put your kids in. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a bunch of toys there. Go ahead. Take the scooter in. Between the cone and there's some stuff on the lower level. We have a bunch of toys for them too. But as soon as they get it, they dig those claws in and do quite a bit of damage to it. <laughs> 
I've been in that crumb up thing too. That's great. He, he likes his raw meat though, right? He doesn't like it cooked. Yeah, everything is raw that they get, but maintains that nutritional value for them. Okay, I've been in the pop up. How I like my meat. <laughs> Thank you very much. Of Yeah. There he is. Hey, bro. That is Rue. Now, from what I heard, he's going to go back and sleep for about 20 hours. Hi, bro. Guess what time it is? Splash time! The shadows are back. Now how many of you are ready for hollow scream? Well, when you come over here, you look out for the shadows. Well, it's way past 3 o'clock. It's hot. It's hot. We did get wet at Chikra. And we're basically going to call it a day on, on our way out. And give you a little look at what they're doing over here. For the entranceway. So they got some construction going on up there. I have no idea what else it got going on. That might be a concrete concrete beam or something. But yeah, they have this whole half all closed out. So thank you guys for watching. And don't forget to hit that red button down there, the subscribe button. And if you like this video, go ahead and hit that thumbs up. We have 232 subs and well, I want to try to hit about 250 by the end of this year, so go ahead, tell your friends, neighbors, tell your pets. There's animals in this video. Your pets will love this video. Catch you next time, guys.